to preparing to live stream. Yeah. Okay, got it. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. We have invited Sheikh Wissam to join us today for a conversation as part of a series called Together We Are Strong. The Together We Are Strong series explores marriage matters, gender roles and drivers of domestic and family violence. So more broadly, one of the things that we've been trying to do is really get under the issue of what is causing domestic and family violence and how do we as a community respond? Now, over the years, I'm sure many of us have heard countless khutbas and shayuk come out and address the issue from an Islamic perspective. We've heard, and I know I've heard time and time again, a very clear message saying, you know, violence is haram. Um, so this conversation is not going to be focused on is it or isn't it prohibited in Islam? I think we need to broaden the conversation and as Muslims we have a responsibility to look at what are the principles of our religion and how do we respond to a whole raft of social issues affecting our families. And I think oftentimes we always look at the big thing when we're in a crisis. And what I really wanted to do was invite Sheikh Wissam today to take us back a few steps and to look at before we're even in a situation where families are experiencing breakdown or family violence, what are some of the things that could be happening that if we were responding in a more open um, and proactive way, perhaps we can create a positive impact that would benefit our family units and inshallah preserve them. So Sheikh, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and have this conversation. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I know when I sent you the guide, you said I could, <laughs> I could write essays to respond to some of these questions and look some of the things we'd like to discuss they are very broad but the broad uh, context and what the research says around gendered violence or drivers of violence against women um, there's a few points that they explore and I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you um, for how you think as a man as a father as a husband as a, a leader at an institute what role you think we can be playing and how we can be responding. So one of those drivers was uh, condoning of violence against women. So this normalizing response, you know, the idea that it's excusable for men to use violence in certain situations and they can't always be held responsible. Um, and shifting the blame really from the person who's committed the act of violence to the person who's experienced the violence, so the victim survivor. Um, I, I think it would be, an, an interesting insight from you around how do we shift that mindset? How do we shift it so that the person who comes and says, this has happened to me, doesn't get blamed, but instead we're able to more um, neutrally respond where we understand that there's been a perpetrator and a victim and we don't necessarily need to stigmatize or shame or harm the perpetrator, but also the harm that has happened needs to be addressed. Very important uh, topic and very important uh, question that you raise. And many times, if I could just sort of uh, give you an example, I think maybe that's a good place to start. <clears throat> I've been in circumstances where I've had to be in the middle between obviously giving some, some advice and counseling in some marriage sessions. And it, it does happen. If people think that it doesn't happen, it does happen. Uh, people often, especially in, in the cases that, that I've uh, dealt with, um, you, you may have the, the, the man who's, uh, you know, he's, he's breached um, the, uh, you know, any rules of Sharia and Islam, uh, and he's been physically, he's assaulted his wife. And so it, and then he's put the blame on her. So this has happened. This is not something that just happens on TV or you see in the movies. This is actually happening. And, and there's a, there are many, many cases like this. And often what I found in that situation, first and foremost, I explain Islam's stance and education is key. So go into your question. We can't stop educating. Obviously, you can't stop talking about it. You can't stop uh, discussing it in forums like this or, you know, people who, you know, are led, um, uh, you know, by, you know, by those aspects of justice that underpin any civil society. And so 
ultimately it is about educating and you know i often ask you know the question about you know the situation um and uh you know in circumstances like that you know you have many many and it's it's a scourge on society but you know sometimes the woman is there who's been assaulted by by this man and she she is seeking to educate him this is sometimes i know it sounds you know, and i'm a bit hesitant to speak about it but these are the realities mm. um for people who think that it's not happening she's there to educate him and and i'm sometimes perplexed that that's all she's there for given the circumstance and so you know knowledge and education cannot stop cannot stop occurring at any level and it starts really young so to break the cycle it has to start at a really really young age so the blame often i found um people who never look inward you know people blame others because they never look inward and that it's there's a there's you know this notion um you know that i was angry or this notion that it was acceptable or this notion and when you start to dig you can sort of see where it comes from. You have to root, you have to root it out and purge it, um, and that has to be filled, obviously, with sound education. You know, uh, as you said, you know, no one in Islam, in their right mind, um, any scholar, any imam, or anybody who's ever studied would ever say that is permissible. Uh, no average person, no general person, knows anything about Islam. You know, the Prophet ﷺ was the walking Quran. These things are very, very clear. So. You know, to put that blame on somebody else is telling of who you are. That's really what it is. That, that's actually got nothing to do with Islam. I should make that point. Mm. That, that actually shows where you're at. This is very telling as a human being of what you need to do. No one can commit an act and then put the blame on the other person. In fact, Islam teaches the contrary. Islam is about looking inward. We look at our actions. We don't commit an atrocity. We don't commit a grievance and a breach and then put the blame on somebody else just to satisfy some emotion that we had. This is, Islam is underpinned by that notion. So I think this is very, very important from the get-go. So teachings need to be always uh, had from when they're young up until, you know, they become, uh, uh, they become teenagers and then uh, uh, enter adulthood. SubhanAllah, just your response has prompted two other thoughts. The first question I have for you is, um, do you think that part of it is, well, have you seen a shift over the years? You've obviously counseled probably countless couples. You've had young women and men through your center. Have you noticed a shift in men's willingness to access support? Or do you think that that is something that is still very stigmatized? I have. I have seen a shift um, somewhat. Um, and so some of the shifts that, that I've seen, I've, I've had people who have said, you know, I need help. I, I actually need help. And... You know, I've had situations where the, they've both come in and the woman has said, uh, look, I don't want a divorce. These are her words. I don't want, but if it happens again, I can't. And, and this is obviously something with domestic violence is, is a scourge. Domestic violence, anybody who talks about the violence, it is, it is horrific. Mm -hmm. And so I've had and been seeing more and more people who come and say, I want help. I need help. I need A, B, C, D. And I, I refer them on. So that's when they, they need definitely uh, a psychologist and that's okay. That's mm. okay. That's fine. People, you know, there's this traditional or tradition that says that if you see a psychologist or you see help and, and there's something, you know, wrong with you. And, and this is the wrong thing that we want to be teaching kids. It's okay to get help. They teach you skills. They, they, they upskill you. They, they give you things that you know you never thought that were possible that you could achieve, and it's okay to see to see a psychologist. I have seen a trend, um, you know, but I also see that fluctuate every now and then. So it, I don't want to say that you know we're, we're we're getting ahead of this because you know there's a pattern where sometimes you see people they want the help and they ask, but sometimes you see that people uh, more and more come in and uh, are having this issue. Uh, my second question from your first response was around the relationship of the adults that you're saying, whether it's it's men and women. Obviously, there's a lot of um, trust in their relationship with you and they'd be sharing uh, yes. very personal information with you. Have you also noticed, because I often think about my first relationship with a man is the relationship I have with my father mm. and the first relation and obviously my mother, but I'm just I'm looking at that relationship for women with men. And also for some of these men with either of their parents, 
have you identified a pattern where family violence has been perhaps a trauma and just a repeated behavior and it's a cycle that's continuing or is it sometimes that this is the first person and there was no history in that family but you're dealing with a couple that this is an issue that's showing up in their relationship absolutely you hit the nail on the head and and it, and it is a cycle and i've seen it generated and repeat itself over and over and then when people tell you about how they you know what what happened to their parents and what they went through you it's very very sad that i have to tell for example right i have to tell somebody this is unacceptable to happen to you subhanallah this is unacceptable to happen to you and being in that position where somebody might even think that that could even be warranted that 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 that's sort of what sometimes brings anger and frustration people listening might think no that can't be the case but you know i am in the thick of it and i hear it all the time and if you ask these mashaykh they all have you know they all know right because they're hearing these these inside um, situations and stories. So this is the unfortunate thing, obviously, but that pattern, that cycle needs to break. And then you have circumstances where somebody has come from a family whereby they, they haven't been subjected um, to anything like that. So that pattern of violence and, uh, and, and, and then they become traumatized. Then, then they become traumatized. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's something that obviously difficult and not easy and, then you have to obviously follow the steps to obviously bring uh, bring about what needs to come about. But you know these things are, are are not easy. They're very difficult. They do cause trauma. The patterns aren't easy, and people often don't realize. But the person who's been subjected to the violence, you know what happens is they 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 there's a self esteem issue as well. You know we we start talking about self esteem. We start talking about you know hating on oneself. They hate on themselves. You know they they lose hope. They they lose things um that that human beings should not lose and so this cycle you see it often and and they do things that ordinarily they wouldn't even do but it's so unfortunate that has to be the case so hence why we say it starts very early on from from a daughter having that relationship with her father and how the father treats the mother you know many mashiach have said it's not my saying i actually heard it uh from one of my mashiach who said that one of the best forms of combating domestic violence is how the husband treats all the women in his life his mom uh, his wife his daughters everybody so this is one of the best things to root out them and you're role modeling what are you doing you're role modeling to who you're role modeling to your sons right you're role modeling to your to your daughters you're teaching them what is acceptable unacceptable this is very important very very important it's obviously important to both we understand that both the husband and the wife role model but predominantly um violence is from the male right it is i mean even though some does occur from the female but predominantly it is overwhelmingly it is from the male and hence that relationship and that role model is so critical um that you have with all uh the 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 women in 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 your life everybody so even to your daughter at a very young age to so she understands what is acceptable and unacceptable very important yeah it's interesting we're talking about these couples some of them choosing to stay in their relationship i think what's often still misunderstood in our community is that domestic violence is about power and control and so we're not talking about an equal relationship we're talking about mm. one of the partners is subjugated to it, an experience of fear and it's deliberate and it's by design yeah. um and so one of the drivers of violence and the research shows that if you're in a dynamic where men are controlling all the decision making and i see this as a a normal thing culturally you know like as a arab woman growing up i was socialized with the idea that men control all the decisions and they also allow to limit your independence so they're allowed to say for example you can't work or you can't go out and that was seen as acceptable you know another thing that was acceptable and as i came into a position of leadership in the community I received a lot of pushback because it was seen as this is not the place for women this is the place for men. And so I'm wondering, you know, if these ideas that men are the head of the household, they control how the money is spent, women can't go and come because it's seen as a problem. Um how do we start to address some of these ideas that seem quite fixed and get people to kind of broaden their understanding and just be more open and flexible to different ideas of what 
is acceptable in a family unit. I, I do want to ask that, but you just at the beginning of that question, you, you did mention something that the dynamics of because sometimes people say to the to the to the woman, to the female, why didn't you walk away? And they blame her and attack her and as though she did something wrong. And let's just make one thing clear. It's not easy. And, and that power in a Stockholm, people still feel, where am I going to go? He's got the money. He's got everything. And I, where am I going to go with these kids? What am I going to do with them? And so it's, it's the fee as well that comes with it, not having anywhere yeah. to, to turn. This is it. People, people who haven't heard and haven't been subjected to what's, you know, what these things uh, entail. Um, I think you can't be quick to judge or criticize um, in that regard, because there's a lot of fear involved in there and control. Look, the other thing I would say in terms of notions to the, to the latter part of your question is inferiority, the notion of inferiority, right? Anyone in Islam who ever fear, if, if anyone, any Muslim adherent says that uh, a, a male is greater or supersedes a female, doesn't know Islam. Uh, you know, betterness or great greatness is not based on gender. In Islam, this does not exist. So we have to nip that in the bud very, very, uh, uh, um, in a very significant way because sometimes this can form people's uh, actions and conform the, the, the way that they behave. The, what, in fact, uh, is superior in, in God's sight is your connection with him. So it's not based on gender. This notion of I am greater or you're lesser or you're lesser and I'm greater, that doesn't exist in Islam. And the prophet came to root that out. What superiority is based on is your connection to God. And that is what it comes down to. Illa bi taqwa. So taqwa. And we know that one of the greatest persons, um, you know, in, in history um, was Maryam, um, uh, the, the mother of Isa. And so this is, so she's one of the greatest human beings. We don't just say females or, or, or women. One of the greatest human beings, Fatima, radiallahu anha. We don't have to start mentioning the list of women uh, to justify that. That's that's a known thing in Islam. We've done it on previous occasions. But in Islam, this is what uh, the reality is. So ultimately, I mean, to really understand uh, this these concepts of how people are behaving, well, it comes down to their behavior. Is it entrenched in Islam? Does it come from, does it ensue from Islam? I mean, these are the questions that we have to be asking because greatness is not based on gender. Hence, we're equal in the sight of God. And I think that's very, very critical to understand. And then we can start to address these issues, all of these things that we're talking about. Um, and I think that's really critical to that question. Do you think that it's also about the overlap of culture and religion though? Because I think I grew up and the words ayab and haram were used interchangeably. And so I think part of the challenge sometimes is when things are presented, there might be a cultural mindset that yeah. might come from, you know, my, my Arab, my dad who grew up in a village in Lebanon, who migrated here, who's stuck in a time warp of what women and men did and didn't do, right? Yeah. Because men went to work and women stayed at home and they, they looked after their family. He, he came, he migrated with this mindset, right? So it didn't necessarily come from a bad place. And this is not in any way to diminish or, or disrespect who my father is and, and the life that yeah. he's lived, right? I'm just trying to look at the human being in all of their complexity, yeah. right? So he comes here with this mindset. When he was saying things like, you can't do this and you can't do that. My dad didn't want me to go to university or lead a football club. Yeah. And he's still probably perplexed by the fact I'm not married <laughs> with children. So, you know, here is this man, but he accepts me. He loves me, but it didn't fit his idea of what was acceptable. And so I think the notions of Ayab and Haram were used to control yeah. what he thought needed to happen. Yes. But not necessarily, it wasn't religion, right? Because there's a very clear tradition that you've explained that I've heard in so many beautiful lectures about the richness of our tradition. But yeah. often it's that fusion of cultural norms. Uh, you know, you reminded me something. I'm going to get to that. You reminded me something. You know, I was having a conversation with my daughter um, and it was about marriage. And I said, look, you know, when you get married, I said, I'm going to do your cut with Deb and I'm going to put a few things in your contract. She goes, what's that? <laughs> and my wife what is that, Sheikh? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I'm going to put. I said, the first thing that I'm going to put is that you complete your education completely and utterly. I said, even if it's a PhD. 
Yeah. I said, that must be had. And I'm and in that contract, you're going to have executive power. So that means that these things must be fulfilled. I said, the other thing that I'm going to put in there is you can't marry a second wife. <laughs> Thank God you said it because, wallahi, I think there are anyway. so many women. I would encourage all women to put this in their contracts because I think there was an amana where this didn't need to be a conversation before, but we live in a different time where this has happened so much and it really has had an impact on family units. Yeah. yeah. And look, and then anyway, you know... What, was there anything else, Chef? Because we're all <laughs> taking notes right now. Let's I stop right there. Everyone, <laughs> everyone take notes. No, but on a serious note, because look, at the end of the day, there's 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 exploitation. And so I understand these things that protect and, and will protect my daughter. And I said, look, I'm not, it doesn't mean that if these things happen, that it nullifies, but what it does, it gives you executive power. Yeah. It may be that somebody, for example, you marry some, he marries a second wife and you now have executive power to that. And he's agreed. So that's, and this is very important because I see the exploitation. I see the abuse and no one wants it to happen to anyone. Right. Yeah. I understand them. I see it to my daughter. And that's what I was saying. I was giving her the advice. She goes, anything else? I said, yes. <laughs> anyway, there's a few other things, but anyway, it's, uh, it's not the conversation here, but the thing, the, 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 the truth is that there is a difference between culture and religion. Not everything that is cultural is religion. And that's, that's the reality. People can negotiate in a relationship, yeah. not what, you know, everything that, or some things that may work for one may not work for the other. Some things that work for somebody else might not work for me. Uh, but ideally a marriage is built on love, mawadda, mahabba, mercy, compassion. That's what really it's built upon. But in truth, that there are many things that are negotiated. And so whether that's, you know, uh, you know, taking responsibilities of A, B, C, D, these are my responsibilities. You know, these are your responsibilities negotiated. Like, this is very, very important um, yeah. in any relationship. And so what might have been ab in, you know, 1970 or 1980 is not today. Um, asking for somebody's hand in marriage, you know, that someone from, you know, from Lebanon, for example, I can say that because my parents are from Lebanon, might find that ab if a woman asks for a hand in marriage uh, to, to, to a man. But in actual reality, uh, it's in religion. It's okay. It's fine. There's no problem with it. Um, and that's all right. And so, you know, understanding where that line is drawn. So, you know, culture um, is different to faith. Sometimes it can be overlap, sure. But we've got to know when to draw that line. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just going to quickly check if anyone has commented because I can keep talking to you and it, and I just want to see um, someone said, what about men who say, oh, you don't trust me? Now, I'm assuming this question is in relation to the, the marriage contract and some of those conditions being transparently outlined. No, I'll, ne I'll never. Uh, you cannot look. Trust is one thing, but people are led by emotions, right? When you're entering a contract for the first time, you don't do it. Let somebody else do it on your behalf. So that way it doesn't put anyone in an awkward position. Let somebody else do it for you, mm. right? And so the truth is that you got to be, you, you, these are your rights and you got to fight for them. So it's not just, don't you trust me? No, I, you know, the reality is no one really knows anybody unless uh, you live with them, you've done business with them or you traveled with them. So mm. these are matters that you can't meddle with. It's like, for example, you know, you're asking about somebody's history before you marry them. If somebody lies about that person's history and doesn't tell you, they've committed a sin because they're potentially setting a marriage up for failure. So you can't lie about stuff like that. You have to be honest. You have to be transparent and forward. So likewise, when you're proceeding forward, it's something that we understand, trust, yes. But people also have emotions and desires and sometimes you know, might fall back on something else. So these are in place as a, as a means of protection. So I'm not, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everybody should have a contract and everybody should have conditions there in one, two, three, four. I'm not saying that. Please, no one say that I'm, I'm, I'm implementing that. What I do believe though, wallahi, and I, I was thinking about this, have been thinking about this such a long time. I, and, and now that I say it, I, I guarantee you people will do it, watch. But I believe uh, there should be a, a type of survey that every single person should fill out, right? Um, I've got four daughters. So every man who's going to come and ask for my daughter's hand in marriage is going to fill this out. And I'm going to ask him about everything, right? I think that should be standard across the board. And it should be standard across the board because you never know these days, right? And the way they construct them, you actually get to know a lot about this individual. So I think that's important going forward. It's not about trust. Yes, but there's also emotions and I have to protect myself. Very important. 
Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. And I think there was a way that happened culturally a long time ago, before technology, you know, mm. before modernity, I think the way that happened was families would ask each other and people knew each other well enough. Yes. That they could say this person is married to this person who's related to that. Like my grandmother can give you someone's whole family tree. <laughs> I don't know half my relatives yeah. now, you know, so th that social order in society allowed people to do that. And I think just with the modern world, it's actually much harder mm. to really know people and yeah. to be able to go like, like, is this suitable? And is my, my child who's now embarking on a significant um, life journey? Yeah. Are they safe? Is this the right person for them? And I think prevention is better than an intervention later. Yeah. I wish more yeah. parents took that mindset because I do think that there's a lot of pressure young people are facing this idea of what are the milestones that make me an adult. Yeah. And it seems like I, I finish school, I go to uni, I may or may not get through it, but yeah. marriage and having kids make me an adult. No, nah, it's, it's one of those things. But, um, you know, it's you know, we've, we've heard too many instances where people, they marry for a couple of days and then they divorce. And that's terrible. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, I, I sort of don't like to say it, but, you know, society holds, you know, people who have divorced as taboo, a divorcee as taboo. It shouldn't yeah, be the case. It shouldn't people. be the case, right? Yeah. But this is, these are people's mindset. This is how they view the world, which is wrong. But, you know, we've got to get it right. And we have to make sure that those things are in place so abuse does not unfold. And, and these are realities at the end of the day. Look, the Prophet also did give us the ingredients. He said uh, religion and good character. And notice that he didn't just say religion. He said good character. And, uh, you know, that's a fundamental thing. Ghazali wrote a whole piece of what is actually defined as a good character. And I, wallahi, you know, one thing that has, that has, has sort of come out in, in me being in this position for such a long time is this people think that they get married and then all of a sudden they no longer have to work on themselves P people think that's it i i hang up the boots and i don't have to work on myself and that's it the greatest challenge and the greatest difficulty is what's within it's it's yourself so people assume you know this is who i am take me as i am no the prophet sallallahu he said i came to perfect your character and so this is really what it's about. You can't, this is, you have to refine yourself even further within a marriage. You enter the marriage and then you say, okay, what now this is about me becoming the best I can be. You start to refine yourself and you build. And so, you know, marriage is, it can also be the fastest way to God because now there are two people who live together, right? So there are extra challenges. And so if you can overcome yourself, with another person, but yet living with another person, that you are overcoming a lot of a, a lot of things in your life internally, and that's your connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's a, a very beautiful insight. Thank you, Sheikh. I want to move on to this concept of, um, and we touched on it a little bit, but I think yeah. there is this construct around the masculine and the feminine. And there's this huge resistance, and I understand where it comes from. There's a movement within the Muslim community to say, let's center Islam and God, right? Let's not accept any Western ideas of feminism or even what they say about toxic masculinity. So we're, we're trying to push out these ideas that seem like they're being imposed on us and try to stick to something that is truth as we understand it through our own tradition. I often think that in Islam, there is already the example and you talked about role modeling around um, previous prophets for example having both feminine and masculine attributes and it or characteristics and it wasn't seen as him losing his manhood for example and a very common example is i know countless stories of when the prophets grieved and they wept right but now there's an entire movement around normalizing men crying and I grew up in a household where my dad easily cries and my, my grandfather, Yani, often he'd, he'd shed a tear and have a moment and it was normal. Mm. So I find this, we, we say we want to push away these other ideas, but they're in our tradition. We no longer live them. So what do you think is happening around these rigid ideas of what is a man and what is a woman and what is feminine and what is masculine and kind of do we follow Western ideas around feminism and masculinity or do we reject those ideas and center Islam? 
what do you think is going on well the, the, there is there is a horrible culture out there um that does exist in certain spaces and you know that culture whether it's a you know un, underpins what what you're saying or underscores what you're saying which is about the, the showing of emotion or you know they have a a, a view about women um they have a view about women roles they have a skewed view about a b c d e f g right so it's just there's a lot going on that is incorrect and so the issue is if i could just touch on one thing you know what defines a man and i think that's a really important question what defines you as a man what defines you as a, as and i say man not male right male is biology but man is something different because the prophet ﷺ defined it as something very different a male that's biology but a man is something else so you have to possess certain characteristics one of those characteristics that you need to possess is that the, you have to possess the ability to hold yourself in a time that you may be upset or angry that's just first and foremost when the prophet was defining what it means to be a man um, but also treatment you know how you treat other people uh, how you behave in a relationship, how you behave towards your mother, your, how you behave towards women. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I could just say, for example, he once came out and openly in front of all of the well, the companions who were there and declared his love for Aisha. And people were waiting in, in anticipation to see what he was going to say. And then he declared his love openly for Aisha. And people were amazed, like, we're gathered here for this. And he declared it. Um, when his son Ibrahim died, uh, وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, he said, in the la tadma. He said, and the, the eye uh, it, it sheds a tear, and, and that's okay. This is part of being a human being. Um, and so outward emotion is very important to display. Um, now, as long as you know, if, if somebody because there was a, one of the companions once in the time of the Prophet when they were reciting Quran, and one of the companions didn't cry. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if his, if his eye didn't shed a tear, but his heart did. In other words, the emotion is there. The, the, it, it's there and, and it's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously could testify to that. But look, it is absolutely the case where being in touch with the emotion is very important because it goes to empathy. And so this is, this is critical, being in touch with that rawness because you end up empathizing for other people in life. The Prophet, like I said, Ali Salatu Salam, he said, for example, openly, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli wana, khayrukum li ahli, the best of you are those who are best to their wives. Um, and some people have interpreted it as, you know, the mum, the sister, the auntie, the daughter, all the women um, uh, in, 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 in a man's life. But, you know, nothing addresses any type of misunderstanding greater than the sound teachings of Islam itself. Wallahi, this is this is what it comes down to. When you really underpin it and you teach the 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 teachings of Islam, the sound teachings of Islam, and I've been in a position because I'm at a high school, so I get these kids all the time, all the time in my office, and we have a conversations, uh, conversation, and I hear these things all the time, and I start, and I know what I'm starting, and when I start the conversation coming from uh, a man and, or male, and I speak to them. And they just, just listening, really, really, really. And so it really starts from when they're very young, you can have that conversation and you can sort of purge those negative, you know, views or, or, or ways that they think out of their, out of their life. Um, and, you know, well, not only that, but out of their jokes when they're in their circles and if they're joking, what to joke about, what not to joke about. Well, if these are principles, why would you joke about them, for example? And, you know, very important. I mean, it's so interesting, that experience of you being in a school directly talking to, to young people. I'm wondering, do you think that some of, because I know we say we socialize them at home, right? And and I had two brothers, Alayhi Hamu, one has passed now, but I know that no matter how much we we talk to them, there's also the influence of their friends, oh, right? And and I know the, the boys talk is not something he would ever have demonstrated in front of me, certainly Muhammad, who's 17 now, is very cautious of, of what is or isn't said in front of his big sister. So I'm wondering is, Yanni, we do our best to socialize them. Do you think that part of it is also what's happening in broader society? Is it a conversation that someone like you can have because of your position outside of that family unit as, an, as a support voice? Is it a conversation that has to be in programs, camps, Yanni, in every sphere and touch point of that young person's life 
societal. Like, it has yeah. to be a collective effort. So everybody in that person's life has to make a difference, has to have that impact or, or, or bring about, if you like, a change in that individual. So it's everybody in that person's life. So they're surrounded by people who only convey the right message. And, you know, it's being in those positions, you know, subhanAllah, I can't tell you that the countless times that I've had people before, I've had people, the true story, um, who've had certain uh, uh, certain things or certain mindsets. And I say to those, and I remember once in a particular situation where I said to this young person, I said, look, if you don't change your mindset, it's not going to work out for you later on when you get married. And subhanAllah, like four or five years later, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing his divorce. And I asked him a question. I said, did you remember that comment once you said to me on the playground? And we had a discussion about that. And that became a, that became a really significant thing for him because I took him back. And then we started talking, talking to for such a long time to yield some, some beneficial outcomes. And so, you know, having everybody in place, you know, whether it's mom, dad, grandfather, doctor, you know, everybody in place around that individual. To, so it becomes like a culture for this individual to know this is how we conduct ourselves in relationships. So I always tell young kids, I always tell young men, especially I'm at a, I'm at a boys' school, you know, what do you think makes you a man? And, and let's be honest. And it's not about, it's not about just the carnal urges. And mm. I, I'm, I'm very clear with them. It's not just about carnal urges, not just about the urges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed within each and every human being. So that doesn't, that is not, what a relationship is about. We, we, I teach them about what actually, what a relationship actually is and what it comes down to. Every relationship, tell them, needs skills. You need skills. You need, up, you need upskilling. You need development. You need insight. You need so many things to bring to a relationship. It's not just, hey, I'm a male and I'm ready for marriage. It doesn't work that way. So it's about almost recalibrating what young people are thinking for them to understand what a relationship actually is and what successful ingredients are required in order to make that successful. So the, the simple skill, for example, I, I was telling these young kids the other day, are you able in a relationship when something upsets you to, are you able to resolve that within yourself? Is it possible to resolve that within yourself? Are you able to turn a negative that you see into a positive? Are you able, for example, to turn something into a joke? You know, we talk about these skills that, and, and unfortunately, a lot of them are not being taken up. And you see that people, they, they move, they shift their problems from one household into another. It's really problematic. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting, that story, subhanAllah. I don't think it's every day someone can say, I had a conversation with a young person in a playground. Five years later, I'm doing their divorce. I'm wondering with that example and others that you can draw on, do you think that the problem is around some of the the male peer relationships they're having, because I think, I, I know I was definitely taught growing up, be mindful of the company you keep, that this tradition, you know, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. So this idea, you, I'm sure you drill it into the kids. My parents drilled it into me. You hear it in Islamic lectures. Do you think that there's something in how young boys and men are bonding that's contributing to the problem? Or do you think it's it's other factors? No, I, I, I do think that identity does play a role, right? Identity does play a role. But before I address that about identity, um, I, I do want to address one thing, right? Lest somebody listening tonight would say, you've put all the, the fault on, 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 on males, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, when we talk about fault, right? Just put, uh, the, put violence just aside just for a moment. When we talk about fault, Sometimes it can be this way or that way, right? When, just fault. Um, but when we talk about exactly what you've said, which is male bonding, identity is huge. Identity is massive. They want to fit in. They want to belong. They want to belong to a group. Social identity is huge, right? So yeah. what, you know, it may be that in a particular environment or gathering, they may put on a particular face just to fit in. And so... Yeah. And that's consistent with the research, what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And often that you, you can you can actually uh, make that habit permanent in your life. It can become secondary in nature. You're playing that role in society. 
So that can become who you are. You've got to be really careful, you know, that that becomes habitual. Yeah. Um, the more, obviously, repetition uh, makes something second, uh, second nature. And so I see this often all the time about identity and kids wanting to fit in. And what we need to really teach the kids is, well, you need to stand on your own principles. It's not only about fitting in. It's not only about saying yes to everybody. Don't be a yes person um, or just go along with people. As the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, you know, don't be somebody who just goes along with what people say or just be a yes person. But rather, if people do good, you do good. And if people do harm, you stay away from harm. So don't be just somebody who wants to fit into the crowd. Don't be like that. You've got to stand on your principles. You've got to stand uh, on your moral compass of what you know to be correct. This is really our guide. This is our balance. If we fall away from that, this is when you start seeing problems. But yes, coming together, that, that whole identity, which comes back to this central point about those, those necessary things of kids' self-awareness. Kids have to have that self-awareness. They have to have, uh, you know, that... Uh, confidence in themselves where it's not only I, I need the confidence, I, I need it from others, right? I, I've got it, self-esteem. I don't need to have it from you. I've got it within myself. And that really gives a person more of a buffer to be able to fall more on those principles uh, than just go with the crowd when when you enter the, those circles, which can become very toxic. Yeah, and I think it's hard when you're a young person and you're going very through hard. the identity formation to, to be willing to stand on your own. You know, peer pressure is a huge thing, I think. Um, and you're going through the the maturation, you're growing and learning and evolving as yep. a person. Do you think ha, working with young people through the Institute, do you see similar things you see in these teenage boys still afflicting young adults or is something else showing up? Is it the male bonding? Is this sense of brotherhood serving a benefit or are we seeing the same problematic things around wanting to fit in the group and participating in whatever we're performing for our our friends what do you think is happening for an older cohort look a lot of that i mean sometimes it they've taken it from young and it becomes entrenched yeah and then it becomes very really hard to sort of purge out and people sometimes don't break free of those circles but what i have seen is that education and good mentoring plays a pivotal role what there needs to be a mentor and a mentor who can take and purge these things out and change uh, the, the way of thinking of those individuals. Uh, it's been done. I've done it. Um, and I, I see it happen. And this is critical. And so you become almost uh, not, oh, I mean, there's many people doing it, but you know, we, our Institute, for example, we have many, many people who are providing this mentoring for others, but also young men, We've also got, you know, women mentoring the women, again, being that positive mentor, uh, leading people into positive uh, or having that positive outlooks, change and so on and so forth. So it can happen. You can break them out of that cycle. They just need somebody in their life, like a coach. And I tell people all the time, you know, you want to upskill yourself. You need to have a coach. You know, you want to change. You want to make inner change. You need to have a coach. You need somebody who can direct you in that regard. So very, very important. It, it can be done. It is done. Um, Ideally, it should start at home, but sometimes it does take that person outside of the household to also have that effect. Mm. Still with me? Um, there's a question from our audience. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm with you. I, I want to ask you a few more questions. I'm going to go to the audience question first. Yeah. How do you have everyone trained to be healthy if we were talking about the cycle of abuse, yes, right? So when it's a cycle, how do we educate an entire community to change or to make the change? That's just to bring about, obviously, okay. So it starts, I mean, if, if you want to look at change, I mean, the, the classic uh, prophetic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad about change is first and foremost, you change yourself. Mm. And and so if you can change yourself, you first, and that's, you know, what, what we need to understand is that the spiritual self needs to be the primary focus. It's really important. It's a primary focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often tell a lot of people that, you know, sometimes people enter a relationship and, and they're looking for others. You know, the lever of happiness or sadness is in another person's hands. And I often say, but it should be in your own hands. People shouldn't have the lever on my happiness or sadness. So whenever they you know, click their fingers, I'm sad. And whenever they click their fingers, I'm happy. That's an internal thing. It should come from me too. I should be, I should have Tumat Nina. It's not to mean that people can't upset us. That's not what we're saying. But really that contentment, 
there's something that comes from within, right? But ultimately, you know, what we're talking about um, here is that, that that's a really, really important focus, um, the spiritual self. Um, and the last part of your question, can you, can you just repeat that last part of your question? So they were asking about how do we yeah. train everybody to break the cycle and yeah. then educate an entire community to make so, so yourself, your family, your community, you know, some of the things that you listed before, having those programs, institutes in society, organizations in society, no, no one person can stop doing their job. We're all responsible. And so ultimately, if we say that the responsibility is not mine, then we've shirked our responsibility. It's on everybody. We can't just shirk our responsibility. That falls to all of us in whatever capacity you're acting. It's on each and every one of us, mother, father, daughter, son. It's on everybody um, to act in that, in, that, uh, in that space. This is really important if you want to bring about societal change and implementation of Dean, that inner focus. This is really critical to who we become, really critical. It's so interesting. I read a book many years ago, but I read it every so often. It's a small yeah. book. I recommend everyone read it. Um, Agenda to Change Our Condition. Yes. I think Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaychaki wrote mm. that book. And it really centered, I mean, because I was always into like, how are we going to transform this community and how are we going to, and the book's like, you got to look within. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> this, this is going to take a long time. Yeah. But essentially, I think your message is consistent with, um, everything I've learned over the years, as, as much as we make an effort to transform others, it, it really, it comes from individuals taking yes. responsibility and saying, I'm going to look within and I'm going to reflect on myself and then I'm going to correct myself. Yes. Let, let me just give one example. I just want to give one example because in one of the exa many examples that I've had, I've had people who obviously have attempted to control um, their spouse in everything that they've in everything that they do and often some of the teachings and and, and these are some of the points at which we absolutely try and drill in to, the, to, to this particular individual this male in question is that the only person that you can really control is yourself mm. and there has to be a point where you you absolutely let go the only one you control is you you have to understand that that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us you can only control you and if, if people want to do A, B, C, D, you know, they're beholden to Allah, right? So you've got, to be, you've got to be really careful in terms of how you perceive or what your outlook on the world is. This is really critical. You've got to control. Your only person you control is you. Then after that, you have to be comfortable in your connection with God. This is really important. That's where you find your comfort. If you're not comfortable in that, then you need, obviously, to, to basically educate yourself. It's unfortunate, but a lot of people, they have this misunderstanding whereby they, they think that, they, that, that they're able or that they have the ability or need to control others, where in actual reality, the only one that they control is you, is themselves. That's it. You can only control you. And then it's your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of my advices, inshallah. Um, Sheikh, I just want to see if there's any more questions before I yeah. ask you a final question to Not close us off. Um, you've got some brothers in here who must be your students sending their love um, and there's no more questions. We always love when the students come on and support their teacher. And actually, I really appreciated your point around um, we need to have a, a teacher or a mentor or someone who guides you, someone who can be very clear in giving you that direction or that nasiha and you're open to hearing it and correcting yourself because you value and you respect that person. I think definitely what we're seeing with modernity is a move away from what what has been a very living tradition in our community and in our culture, a more individualistic, um, I would say selfish behavior where there's not really regard for some of those things. It's it's being I'm going to put the blame over there and I don't internalize or carry any of it, you know, and I think it definitely poses a huge challenge for our community. Mm. Absolutely. I wanted to um, close off by asking you in, in your time, you've obviously been um, volunteering and in service of this community as you pursue your own studies and also the establishment of the Abu Hanifa Institute um, for a long time. And is there anything that you think we need to be discussing or focused on right now 
in order to ensure that in a couple of years we've shifted where this community is at whether we're looking at gender-based violence or other social issues or other issues pertaining to the family unit because i think sometimes we wait until it's so bad where, where we have to do something, we have no choice, but sometimes we can be proactive or have a longer vision for saying, this is where we are today, but if we don't start doing some work, we're gonna be in a much worse state. Absolutely. So uh, just so I, I address that question properly, are you, you're not talking as, as an individual, you're talking as a community or you're talking as an organization. I mean, what? Can you, you can interpret it. Do you want to interpret it as an individual with your own insights or from an organizational communal perspective? I'm happy for you to answer it both ways. Look, absolutely. I, I, I believe one critical thing is scripture and schools. And the reason why I'm a big believer in that is because I've seen the effects and the outcomes that ensue as a result of schools and scripture. So at our institute, we also run uh, prophetic teaching and we teach the kids um and we have a, a really good program um that all these lessons and these things that we talk about uh are really taught since they're five years old right this is really really key so at, at a very young age you're already teaching what should be normal um mm. which is really and you're just teaching islam that's really you're just normalizing it so wherever they get in the education we have to have our fingers right especially on those triggers in terms of schools scripture institutions where they go where they come to so on for our children because we want to direct them to the right areas i think as a parent uh we need to we need to be on top of it who their friends are i don't think we should just uh, just allow our children to just befriend anybody i think this is really important why do i say that is because especially when they're growing up you want them to be around those who are going to uh, impart positive influence upon our children mm -hmm. so something that you've definitely heard from me tonight uh, and that is education education teaching and role modeling these are fundamental education teaching role modeling programs scripture schools very important if we tackle that if we tackle those five things um we're then we're on we're on par to where inshallah to improvement but i think it's really important the other thing that i would add to that is mentoring so mentoring coaching being in that person reaching out to these people this is really really important having those conversations in private right when they're they're listening they're all these right you can relate to each other those are really key so all these things coming together are fundamental i think having those strategies in place just working at it bit by bit bit by bit bit by bit and look the prophet muhammad وسلم, there were things that he did in his time and the fruits were not seen until after his time so I think for us, what we need to do and what we need to understand is just, and, and it's a really important point, brings us back to this main point. Sometimes it's it, it's about just making and doing the hard yards. Right? Mm -hmm. Noor alayhi salam, uh, he preached for 950 years. One uh, great scholar, Ibn Kathir, said that when people entered his ship, there was one opinion says that there was only 80 people on it, thereabouts. And one opinion only says that there were 10. If you measured that by way of quantity, you would say he might have failed, but obviously he didn't. It's about sacrifice. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if and he preached, he came back with blood all over his body, alayhi salatu wasalam. But even though it was the most difficult day of his life, um, you look what happened after. So it's about striving. It's about doing. It's about doing what needs to be done, not shirking your responsibility. So you have responsibility. I have responsibility. We all do. Um, mm -hmm. But also being strategic in implementing all those things that we've just spoken about, whether school, scripture, teaching programs, mentoring, people around them, role modeling, very, very critical to be able to also refine, you know, what might have worked here and not, you know, and to basically reproach what ourselves and what we've done as well and maybe approach it better. So these are just some of the things I would highlight along those best. We need to keep striving um, and have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another key ingredient just to keep having hope that change is brought about. They're not easy. It's not. No, it's these these. It's it's a it, outside, and, you know, relationships. I can't sort of just speak my mind. It's one of those things whereby, but it can be really difficult. Can be really hard. Can be brutal. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've found myself in situations whereby, you know, I, I've I've been nearly assaulted on countless times where I've had to threaten people that we have cameras you know, watching. And so 
you you get in situations where you see what this what is absolutely avoiding society that needs to be tackled you can hear my daughter in the background <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's okay children should be free to express themselves <laughs> even if it is throwing a tantrum <laughs> <laughs> so, it's all good inshallah there is some some of my remarks inshallah um no i appreciate your insight i we do have a question but i'm going to tell ali in relation to your questions we will be having a follow-up live and i will be tackling um this topic so if you We'll be patient with us, inshallah. We have another uh, live, inshallah, next month in October, and we'll have one in November as part of the Together We Are Strong series. This is an ongoing conversation, and I think some of the questions you've asked are important. Sheikh, I really want to thank you for your time and for accepting this invitation. Um, one of the things I am very conscious of is that people often are frustrated at what they think needs to happen and we're blaming um, either community organizations or religious leaders and they see the responsibility yeah they see the responsibility as their you know and then um, some people blame family units and and how we've moved in terms of our culture and what life looks like i'm someone who believes that sure it's important to analyze who is responsible but i mm. also appreciate that every single one of us plays a role absolutely so, I would really urge and invite our listeners today to consider some of the, the insight you've shared with them and to think about what role each one of us can be playing, even if it is only in our family unit. You know, in my pursuit of um, social justice and change, mm -hmm. I often felt most perplexed by my own family. So it's easy to go and talk to the broad public and to get the buy-in in the broad public. Often the people that will drive you up the wall are your immediate family because they're the ones that are the most resistant to everything you have to say. And so it's been um, very insightful because you're right, the challenge is a very inward one. Um, so I thank you so much for your time. Inshallah, please, if you're interested in the work of Sheikh Wissam, check out Abu Hanifa Institute. I just want to make one more point. Oh, please. There's one more point. It's a really important point. And I always say this, and I always teach this as a first point. The inward challenge is very, very important, but there are some things that the inward challenge cannot excuse. Say, for example, in a relationship, you're in a relationship and you're, you're a female, you're a woman, then there's a, there's a point where you, you don't look inward. You have to end what's wrong, right? So that's the exception to the rule. I want to make that point clear. That's the exception to the rule. If something is being done and it's not right, then the, the point is not to blame oneself. This is critical, really important. So does that make sense in yeah, terms yeah, of, of what course. was I said? This is a really important point just yeah. to focus on. So people, less people misunderstand and think, look at yourself inward. No, this is the exception to the rule that if there's no, uh, if there is no abuse, there is no exploitation, then all things are equal. Then, this is where that applies. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So where there is harm, draw the line. Stop absolutely, the harm. absolutely. But where there is not harm, and we're talking more broadly in terms yeah. of just day to day yeah. living, struggle, family dynamics, relationships, correct yourself. Absolutely, it's a, a part. It's just part of general life. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you for having me on. I really Thank appreciate. I really appreciate uh, having me on. Inshallah, you know. Much more we'll have to future. invite you back. We have a series called Being a Man. Brother Hedy runs it. And I think um, he would be thrilled if you were part of this conversation. That's also another series that's going on <laughs> at the moment. I'm sure you guys would have some very interesting insights <laughs> and conversations, inshallah. inshallah um, yeah, yeah. To Thank our audience, much. we would love your feedback. So there is a link in the comment section. Please feel free to share any feedback you have because it will shape the rest of the series. Jazakallah khair.